Welcome back, everyone. Before we begin, I need to thank many people for commenting on the last video. Many of you in Discord voiced a demented demand to become cursed. So here you go. You're now in a video about a cursed film, and therefore, you are now cursed. Wait, what does that say about me? I'm trapped in here. Hmm. We better get back in my Discord and cleanse ourselves in the secret, pure reality chat room. Only those truly dedicated to escaping this false reality will be allowed in. If you're someone who would like to appear in the next video, then comment on this video and maybe I'll spread the dread to you. Now, let's begin. items, some cliches that might come to mind are cursed dolls that stalk us when the lights go out, ancient boxes capable of possessing the owner, antique rocking chairs that sway under invisible beings, old paintings that watch us in our sleep, black magic dolls that turn those under their spell into puppets of pain, unsealed tombs that create chaos and misfortune for those who dare to enter. This list could go on and on. Where great tragedies strike, it's not beyond the realm of reason to assert that a transfer of that trauma and pain would simply move from this plane of existence to something more incorporeal. So if objects can be cursed, why not people? Or even places. Places like Hollywood, California. The land of glitz and glamour, as well as pain, fear, jealousy, death, sadness, and eternal suffering. But at least the beaches are nice. For every Hollywood success story, there are thousands of stories of murder and mayhem, and this beast we call Tinseltown has fangs that drip red with gristle and gore. It's not surprising when you think about what it actually takes to not only survive in Hollywood, but thrive and be successful on top of that. To rise above the rest and stand out as original and talented, there are so many tales of bright-eyed individuals moving out west with high hopes of stardom, only to be beaten down by rejection and competition. Everyone wants your spot. So if someone is fortunate enough to survive the Hunger Games of Hollywood and make it to the top of their field, where they're directing or producing or singing, acting, dancing for the whole world to see, then what do you think it took for them to get there? And what are they now capable of with their newfound power? For example, well-known names like Roman Polanski was also famously known for assaulting a child. He fled to France to avoid his prison sentence. Marlon Brando's son murdered his sister's boyfriend after she had been abused. Marlon also abused his daughter, and she unfortunately committed suicide years later. Joan Crawford is known for expressing violent fits of anger resulting in the abuse of others, including her adopted daughter. All of these incredibly successful people had much darker sides. So in a town of rich and famous supervillains, built on the abused and unsuccessful, it causes some turmoil in the universe. With all of these evil people working together, it might stir up some demons or spirits looking for revenge. And it seems some did just that. Here are the horrible real-life accounts that occurred during and after production of the 1973 film, The Exorcist. There was an astonishing total of nine deaths during or connected to the filming of this movie, as well as many near deaths, injuries, and trauma. The Exorcist is a supernatural horror film by director William Freakin written and produced by William Peter Blatty. Not only is this film considered one of the greatest horror movies ever made, but is often considered one of the greatest films ever made. Being nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, a very rare accomplishment for a horror movie. Here's the plot. 12-year-old Regan is possessed by a powerful demon, and her mother, a Hollywood actress, attempts to save her with the help of two priests. One, a younger priest who is losing faith in the church, and an older priest who has dealt with powerful entities like this before, nearly killing him in the process. The movie was a huge success upon its release. Audiences at the time had simply never seen anything like it before. You have to remember, this was the early 70s, long before films like Saw or even Friday the 13th shocked audiences. 
Lines of terrified moviegoers lined up for blocks. It was an absolute phenomenon. Folks could not stay away from the reported demonic film. Reports began to develop of moviegoers throwing up or passing out from fear during screenings. Some theaters even distributed smelling salts or barf bags to ushers to wake those who fainted from the fright and keep the theaters clean from those being sick. One moviegoer even fainted and broke their jaw during the screening. The studio settled out of court for an undisclosed sum of money. It was that serious of an epidemic. The Exorcist scored the biggest opening day gross for a single theater in the history of Los Angeles motion picture houses and broke established records in every other theater where it opened across the country. In record-breaking, coast-to-coast, first-week grosses, The Exorcist brought in almost $2 million at 24 theaters. In six days, The Exorcist surpassed all previous box office records at three theaters in New York. At Los Angeles, two more theaters were open. In Chicago, the pattern was the same, and the dimensions of The Exorcist experience broke on the motion picture world with an impact rivaled only by the audiences that continued to pour into all these theaters. It was, of course, first evident to the theater managers that The Exorcist was no longer just the most successful motion picture in film history, but had become an unquestioned sociological phenomenon, breaking out of the theater pages and television reviewers' hands to the city desk, the front page, and hard news on telecasts from coast to coast. Something was scaring these people. Was it the subliminal messages, like the flashing faces of the demon, peppered into the film, or something more? Reverend Billy Graham once said, The devil is in every frame of this film. What if he was right? What if this wasn't just a film, but something more demonic at play? David Sheehan is with us tonight to talk about a movie that has people passing out in the lobby on their way in or on their way out, David. Well, you've heard about all those reports about The Exorcist and uh, the trouble it's causing, people fainting and so forth. I went to check it out. The manager of the National Theater in Westwood says that there indeed are at least a dozen people who faint or become ill during every showing. But The Exorcist is still drawing sellout houses for every performance, complete with lines around the block. I spent an evening in the lobby just to see if people really do come stumbling out in the middle of the picture, as reported. They did, so I asked them why. It just scared me to death. Things just like this, just, it just scared, really scared me to death. I'm just nervous. Are you going to go back in and see more of the movie now? Probably, yeah. What are you going to do right now? I don't want to see it, but my curiosity is killing me. I have to see it. I fainted like 10 minutes after the first beginning of the movie. And I walked out and they gave me some water. I passed out in, in about the first half hour, yeah. yeah. Do you remember what, what it was, what scene it was that affected you so convulsions, much? Convulsions, when she took convulsions. Because I have a little girl and it was like watching my little girl. I think it's disgusting. Why? I don't know, it's just, it's just, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't make me want to get sick like everybody says. It just, my legs are just going, Neh. and I want to go in the lobby and not watch it, and I have to cover my ears. <laughs> what was it that made that happen? When, when she started talking, like, devil coming out of her. <laughs> How about you? Uh, I can't even describe it. It's so horrible. It just... I don't gonna... know why I waited four hours to see that. <laughs> the devil made her did it, I bet. The fact that people do wait four hours in line and then go back in to see more after they've fainted or gotten sick, I guess it shows how far some people will go for the thrill of being chilled to the bone. And uh, judging from my long night in the lobby, the people most susceptible to being profoundly upset by the film are those who went in believing in the devil, Roman Catholics especially. As a matter of fact, the Pope himself is being quoted as part of the film's publicity campaign. Demonology, he said, is an important part of Catholic doctrine that really ought to be studied again. And on that level, some psychiatrists are calling The Exorcist a dangerous movie because it does give credibility to a variety of superstitions, including the devil myth and the power of ritual. So it may be true to some, The Exorcist might be dangerously convincing. To me, The Exorcist is nothing more than a fantastically well-made and very shocking chiller, or thriller, if you prefer. It wasn't until after the film's release that strange tales of occurrences, both on and off the set, began to spill out as if some otherworldly presence heard that this film and others like it were being made and had something to say about it, maybe even try and stop it. 
those working on the movies were paying a heavy toll for their involvement. First and foremost, The Exorcist was inspired by actual events. In 1949, a boy given the pseudonym Roland Doe was said to have befallen possession of an entity in much the same way the character Regan does in The Exorcist. I did some digging and learned that the boy lived in Cottage City, Maryland, and his real name was Ronald Hunkeler. According to my research, this is the true story that inspired the book and the film The Exorcist. Ronald lived with his parents and Aunt Harriet. His aunt was a spiritualist who purchased a Ouija board. The two used the Ouija board often, determined to reach their deceased family members. Ronald would also play with the Ouija board alone in the late night hours. On Saturday night, January 15th in 1949, Ronald's parents went out. His grandmother stayed at the house to watch their son. Ronald, as usual, took out his Ouija board to play. Later that night, the two heard strange dripping sounds and rattling. They walked through the house and discovered the source of the rattling was a painting of Jesus Christ vibrating and bouncing off the wall where it hung. Eleven days later, Aunt Harriet died unexpectedly. That was when things got much worse. After Aunt Harriet's death, the family experienced furniture moving on its own. Many unexplained noises in the house and vases flying when levitating when Ronald was nearby. The family's Lutheran pastor, Luther Schultz, offered for Ronald to spend the night at his house in order to observe his behavior. The night was normal and uneventful. Ronald and Luther had a nice conversation until heading to bed. That's when Luther heard scratching coming from Ronald's room. Upon inspecting, Luther discovered Ronald sitting on the floor, staring off into space as his bed levitated behind him. He then noticed two black lines on Ronald's face swimming around like snakes under his skin. When he picked up the boy to get a closer look, the black lines exploded from his face, spilling blood all over Luther. After this event, the pastor advised the boy's parents to take him to a Catholic priest because this was not a matter he could handle. Ronald underwent numerous exorcisms. During one of the exorcisms, Ronald slipped one of his hands out of the restraints, broke a bed spring from under the mattress, using it as a weapon, slashing the priest's arm. In another exorcism, the priest visited Ronald in his relative's home, where they too saw a shaking bed, flying objects, and Ronald speaking in a guttural voice and exhibiting an aversion to anything holy. The priest was granted permission from the archbishop to perform another exorcism. The exorcism took place at the Alexian Brothers Hospital in South St. Louis, Missouri. One of the priests stated that during the exorcism, the words evil and hell, along with other markings, appeared on the boy's body. Roland, in a physical fit, lashed out and broke Priest Halloran's nose. Halloran told a reporter that after it was all over, Ronald went on to lead a rather ordinary life. They did it. They saved this poor boy from the devil himself without any other casualties, unlike the terrifying film that came 30 years later. You can imagine what a gruesome experience it must be to live through a possession and an exorcism. And if you can't, well, I have some audio for you from the infamous real-life case of Annalise Michelle, a 23-year-old German woman who experienced being possessed by the devil. Warning, the imagery and audio is a bit gruesome. Annalise has black eyes, broken teeth, and a bloody face from what is assumed to be self-inflicted wounds. This is a real-life recording of her exorcism. The day it all seemed to end, Annalise was no longer growling or screaming. She told her mother she was scared. That night, she passed away. She only weighed 68 pounds. It's a truly sad and tragic case. Annalise's story is what inspired the film, 
The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Now, let's dive into a few of the things that happened on the film set of The Exorcist. The set of the film actually caught fire, delaying production for six weeks. Strangely, the bedroom set for Regan's possessed character was left untouched while the rest of the stage smoldered and burned as if the fires of hell itself lit them. A priest named Thomas M. King was brought in to bless the set, but still, the production was plagued by tragedy. The mother and daughter duo of the film, playing concerned mother Chris McNeil and daughter Regan, both suffered serious back injuries during the production, with Blair actually fracturing her lower spine. In the scene where Regan throws her mother across the room, Ellen landed hard on the floor. She still has back troubles today from this event. The director wanted another take, and Ellen said, the man pulling her stunt wire is pulling her too hard. William, the director, responded, well, it has to look real. To which Ellen said, I know it has to look real, but I'm telling you, I could get hurt. So he said, okay, don't pull her so hard. But then I'm not sure that he didn't cancel that behind my back because the guy smashed me into the floor. Linda Blair said, I had a lot of difficulty living with the aftermath of The Exorcist. The back injury was far more serious than I had imagined and really affected my health negatively for a long time. Here is a screen test showing the mechanism that caused her back injury. Fortunately, both were able to mostly recover, but things were only going to get worse from there. Actor Jack McGowan, who was killed in the film by the demon possessing young Reagan, actually died shortly after completing his work in the film. He died in New York from the flu. He was never able to see the film. Actress Vasiliki Malerios played Jason Miller's mother. She'd never acted before. The director saw her working in a restaurant and asked her to be in the movie. She cast a haunting figure in the film itself. She died just a month after the film's release. Was this life imitating art? Actress Linda Blair and actor Max von Sydow, who played the older priest, both also lost family members during the filming of The Exorcist. Max von Sydow played Father Marin, who interestingly was only 43, but made to look much older with makeup. On his very first day of filming, he lost his brother. Axel Ulrich Bertel von Sydow. Mercedes McCambridge was the horrifying voice of the demon in the film. She was able to do such a brilliant performance due to chain smoking and making herself vomit up raw eggs and applesauce. Her bringing the demon to life may have caused her one of the heaviest and most gruesome tragedies of all. Years after the film, her son John Markle was fired from his job at an investment company in Little Rock, Arkansas. Oddly enough, on Friday the 13th, this was the beginning of the end. Three days later, on Monday, November 16th, during loud thunderstorms, John killed himself and his family. The drug, Elavil, was found in each family member. In the living room VCR was the tape, The Nightmare on Elm Street, a film where nightmares come to life to kill you. And that's just what happened. While wearing a wrinkly Halloween mask, John killed his wife and his two daughters. Then at 4 a.m., called his attorney and said, come to the house. He then put guns to each side of his head and pulled the triggers. 15 minutes later, the police arrived. John's mother, Mercedes, became the voice of the demon in The Exorcist. And now her son was the face. Injuries and accidents seemed to plague the production. The man responsible for refrigerating the set, a studio watchman, Max von Sydow's brother, Linda Blair's grandfather, and a cameraman's baby all died. A gaffer caught off his toe, and a carpenter reportedly lost some fingers. It should be noted that director William Freakin was said to slap actors prior to takes and even fire live rounds from a handgun to shock them into reactions for his movie, reactions caused by what can only be described as abuse. Rooms were refrigerated 
to freezing temperatures, and set riggings on actors malfunctioned all the time. Through objections from actors that safety was seemingly being ignored for the sake of this monster that had taken the form of film. He was a director in some sort of possessed state from reports on the set with many describing what can only be described as hellish conditions. Actor Jason Miller, who played the priest, Father Karras, almost lost a child to a strange and tragic incident during production of the movie. His son Jason Patrick would later become a famous actor and star of two of my favorite 80s movies, Solar Babies and The Lost Boys. He would even go on to date actress Julia Roberts just days after she canceled her wedding with Kiefer Sutherland in 1991. So he defeated Kiefer in the film The Lost Boys, and then again in real life. Although we haven't seen Patrick in anything since, seems Kiefer did win in the end. But before all of this, when he was just seven years old and his father was making The Exorcist, he nearly died after being run over by a motorcycle. Was it an accident or something more? Supposedly, Miller was given a warning by a priest which could have foreshadowed the event in question. According to the website, The Independent, the priest told Miller, reveal the devil for the trickster that he is. He will seek retribution against you, or he will even try and stop what you are trying to do to unmask him. The priest handed Miller a medallion to protect him from further harm. It seems it worked. Nothing further haunted Miller or his family, and his son lived through the accident. As if all of this isn't enough, a real life serial killer also worked on and was seen in the exorcist movie paul bateson was a radiologic technologist who was featured during the hospital scenes even speaking lines of reassurance to the character of reagan while she has administered some procedures his gentle bedside manner is showcased heavily in the scenes he was in which is in stark contrast to what was soon to be revealed about his much more sinister real-life personality. To give the film an air of authenticity, real staff from NYUCM were used in place of actors and Bateson was shown prominently in what some consider one of the more graphic parts of the movie. What no one at the time could know is that a few years later, Bateson would be involved in a grisly murder of film industry reporter Addison Verrill. Bateson had met Verrill at a bar called Badlands and the two had eventually gone back to Verrill's apartment for more drinks, drugs, and adult interaction. At some point, Bateson crushed the reporter's skull with a metal skillet and stabbed him in the heart, murdering Verrill in cold blood. Police eventually caught Bateson, and he was linked to and suspected of as many as six other murders, although he was only ever charged with the one murder of Verrill, even with testimony of a friend of his saying he liked to kill and that he had dismembered the bodies of an unspecified number of victims, stuffed them in garbage bags, and dumped them in the Hudson River. Bateson himself bragged of the killings to other inmates. No follow-up investigations were ever conducted, and the ultimate ironic art-imitating-life scenario, Exorcist director William Freakin was inspired to direct the 1980 film Cruising from his experience with Bateson. The film is about an undercover New York City detective trying to stop a serial killer in New York City's gay community. Bateson was released in 2003 when he became eligible for parole, and according to social security records, died in 2012. Justice never served for half a dozen souls. When The Exorcist was released, many cities tried to ban the film entirely. In the UK, it was unavailable to own until 1999. On a final strange note, a church across from the Rome premiere was struck by lightning causing its 400-year-old rooftop crucifix to crash to the ground below as throngs of moviegoers looked down in horror. After learning of all of this tragedy connected to the film, it makes me genuinely wonder if the film is really cursed. That's an awful lot of death connected to one of the scariest movies ever made. I think I'm a logical person. I enjoy coincidence and will admit it's fun to speculate and read into fantastic ideas. It makes our world feel a little deeper and unexplored. Some of us like to think we have it all figured out, and that there's a logical explanation for everything. I'm sure there is, but I just feel we're not at a point where anyone knows those explanations. I often talk to the ones in my life about ghosts and unexplained phenomena, and they say science can explain it all. Well, who's to say ghosts, demons, and curses aren't scientific? If a person from 100 years ago saw anything from today, they'd think everything was a demon. I prefer not to shut down any ideas. I'd rather enjoy the excitement of fearing the unknown, because at some point, we'll understand it all and everything will be a lot less fun. Therefore, I am convinced 
that I think the exorcist is cursed, but to find curse, maybe someday we will. Thank you for joining me, everyone. Don't forget to listen to my podcast under the same name, Grave Stories, found everywhere podcasts are located. And don't forget to check out Tinfoil Tom's YouTube channel. Tom helps me with the research and writing of these episodes. Check out his videos where he breaks down and explains real life conspiracies. In the next episode, we will reveal more real life tragedies from yet another Hollywood hit when we discuss the real life horrors connected to the 1980s film Poltergeist. Goodbye.